Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. In today's program, I've got Dr. Scott McKnight with us, uh, and we're going to be talking about the Second Testament, an exciting translation that Scott's put together, and uh, we're going to be chatting about that today. So you stay tuned, it's going to be a fun episode. We'll see if we stay tuned. And that gets edited out because we're not live. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Josh Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Just hit over 100,000 subscribers here on the channel. If you haven't joined the bandwagon, you need to make sure to hit that subscribe button uh, as you're watching the program. I think we're reaching right about a million viewers each month, which is really exciting. So if you're watching right now, maybe for the first time, join the bandwagon, hit that uh, subscribe button, uh, and get notified every time we come out with content just like this. Uh, we've got an exciting guest uh, for you today. Got Dr. Scott McKnight's been on the program multiple times to discuss the King Jesus Gospel, a church called Tove, different books that he has written. Uh, he's a prolific author, uh, lots of great content uh, coming out of uh, Scott and, and his work. So I'm excited and eager to introduce you to him and his ministry. But before I do that, I wanna remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. So if you wanna support the channel, there are links in the description to do so. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal or a reoccurring gift on Patreon. If you choose to give on Patreon, for those five bucks a month, you'll get access to extra content. Um, all that to say, there's also a conference in September if we haven't sold out. Uh, September 14th through 16th, you should go check that out. Links for that can be found in the description. And finally, I don't think I have bronchitis, but my voice sounds ridiculous. So I apologize for all of you who have to listen to this. I'll try to let Scott speak the most. Uh, Scott, uh, I'm here with Michael Miller because uh, Roundtree is out today. Uh, uh, let me just start off by saying, Scott, tell us a little about yourself and your ministry before we dive in. Okay, thank you very much, Josh and Michael. Um, I'm a, let's see, I've been a professor for over four decades now. And um, I teach at Northern Seminary in Lyle, Illinois, outside in the Western suburbs. And um, I'm an author, a professor, a teacher, speaker, um, I've been uh, married to my high school sweetheart. So uh, we've been married about 50 years. Two children and two grandchildren. So how's that? Praise God, and I love it. What, where would be good places for people to uh, connect with your material, whether it be blogs, videos, resources? Like how do they, how do they check out your content? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, wherever you buy books. That's that's one of my primary media, I suppose. But I have a Substack newsletter, which is sort of a new version of a blog, and I'm on uh, Twitter and a little bit on Instagram and Facebook as Scott X McKnight, and then um, I'm on Threads. So I am totally up to date with the latest social media. And uh, my wife has to remind me to use threads because I don't remember it. No worries at all. How many, how many books have you written? This is a question that uh, makes, makes a person nervous, but um, <laughs> let's just say it's between 90 and 100. <laughs> between 90 and 100 books you've written, which means you've written more oh books than gosh. Miller has read. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was one time with a major scholar, Jewish scholar, Jacob Neusner, and I, we were writing in, in Orlando, Florida together to a conference. And, and I said, I said, Jack, his name was Jack. I said, Jack, how many books have you written? He said, I just reached 600 this week. But he said, don't be impressed. Only the first 100 are hard. <laughs> and I said to him, uh, very few know the experience. So I think I'm close. That's good. I like it. Well, let's let's uh, dive into the content. Scott, tell us why did you why did you write this uh, this New Testament? Uh, how is it different than other Bibles? Yeah, um, I I will I will want to say that uh, I I'm translating the New Testament, not really writing the New Testament. Right. Although my children used to tell their friends that I wrote the Bible because I translated Luke in an old translation. Um, there's an Old Testament translation called the First Testament by John Golden Gay that was the foundation of a, a little commentary reflection series that he wrote. The 
corresponding volumes in the New Testament were by Tom Wright, the Bible for Everyone. And Tom also translated the New Testament for his Bible for Everyone. It became the Kingdom New Testament. Then the publisher published Golden Gay's Old Testament, which uh, and Tom Wright's New Testament, for as and they called it the Bible for Everyone. But when I read John Golden Gay's translation, which was published separately by InterVarsity, um, I I said to an editor at InterVarsity, I said, you know. The translation by John Golden Gay of the Old Testament is shouldn't be bound together with the translation by Tom Wright of the New Testament because the theories of translation are so different. So the editor talked about it. He's an Old Testament scholar. He says, what do you think should be done about it? And uh, I said, well, I think you need to try to find someone to translate the New Testament like John Golden Gay did the Old Testament. He said, would you do it? And without a moment's hesitation, I said, yes, I would I would love to do that. So I spent the bulk of the next two, well, more than the next two years translating the New Testament, three to four hours every morning, um, and trying to do it according to the translation approach of John Golden Gay that he did for the First Testament. That's why it's called the Second Testament. Good. Uh, Scott, did you, was this an enjoyable project for you? Like, did you, was this a, like, well, I would imagine like writing a Bible would be like standing in the middle of traffic of the evangelical world, you know, to getting hit by both sides of traffic, middle of the road. Yeah, you, like, you're you going to make Kendrick's everybody angry. Guys. You got the, the guys who are like, hey, it's all about readability. You got guys that are like, hey, it's, you know, uh, word for word, or it's, it's all about paraphrase. Like everyone is so energized right now when it comes to Bible translations and maybe it's always been this way, but, um, it was, well, this, there's was this a sense in which there project? should be energy. Yeah. I mean, I think there probably should be, but like at the same time, was this, was this an exciting project or as a scholar, was this kind of like an intimidating feat slash, uh, I don't know, were you trepidatious at all in, in producing this? Well, um, you know, people are, People all have opinions about how the Bible should be translated, 99% of whom can't read the original languages to make really truly intelligent remarks about translations. But uh, that's the way it works. People are very familiar with the Bible. Um, but when you start translating the New Testament, as I did, and realize that this is going to go public, that's when all of a sudden you realize, you know, I just translated the word Basileia, which is always translated in translations, kingdom. And I just translated it with the word empire. What are people going to say about that? I mean, I thought about this constantly. And there are some words that occur, you know, I was just looking at a word yesterday, 146 times. And I wanted every instance of that word to have the same English word, one for one, as much as possible. And there are there are instances where I made shifts seventy five words into into the New Testament, and had to go back and adjust all of them. So uh, it was I wouldn't say it was intimidating. I th I thought you had a pretty cool word trepidatious. I don't think I've ever heard of that word. Um, yes, it was it was intimidating in the sense that. You know, this is a very serious task. This is the Bible. This is God's word. This is what people read for their spiritual nurture. People preach from these sorts of things. Um, everybody's going to have an opinion. And I've experienced some of this already. And it's perfectly fine. I mean, I saw somebody on Facebook say yesterday, uh, Scott McKnight could have no rhyme or reason for this. Well, the fact is he didn't ask me because I did have rhyme or reason for that. Uh, rhyme and reason for that. But uh, people are going to say things like this because it's a translation and it's pretty serious stuff. So yes, I was, I was very cognizant of what I was uh, attempting to do. Praise God. It's good. When you mentioned in the uh, preface of the second Testament that you want English readers to experience what the Greek readers experience when reading the new Testament, could you explain what you think the, the new Testament uh, what English speakers miss out on when they're reading the New Testament? Um, 
Okay, uh, it's very important for me uh, to say two things. There's two words that are involved here. One is familiarity. People are familiar with the translation and they think their translation, therefore, is the right translation. And I'm not going to dispute that. It might be the right translation. It's a good translation no matter what. So familiarity. The other one is this is a supplemental translation. This is for people. This is what Golden Gay said, and this is what I say. This is for people who are familiar with the Bible, who are Bible readers, and they're looking for something to, let's say, shock and stun and surprise and make them think again about the translation that they're using. And so I feel like uh, people who will read my translation, the Second Testament, will look at it and go, now what? What does the NIV or what does the NLT, whatever translation people are using, NRSV, UE, um, they'll, they'll look at it and say, what does that say? And then they will be comparing them. And I want to I wanna say that when people are arguing with me and when people are comparing, that is exactly what I'm trying to achieve, is to try to get people to think more uh, in a fresh and new way about the text that they're reading. So we talk about the, the text of Scripture. There are different ways of, uh, for, for those who are watching, you might not be super familiar with how we, we do translations. We, we try, I think, the best of our ability with most modern translations is to grab a bunch of Greek manuscripts, as old as we can get our hands on, as, as uniform to all the other manuscripts as we have, as we can determine, and, and then we take those manuscripts, uh, which of, we have like 5,600 copies of, and we try to translate them into modern English. And there are different schools of thought on how to translate those things. Um, Scott, could you maybe explain to our audience what a natural dynamic equivalency is um, and, and how your work compares to something like an NRSV, an NIV, and a CEB? Um, as as different Bible translations would try to more of a dynamic translation and how your your translation maybe would compare to something like that. Okay, a dynamic translation, a dynamic equivalent is uh, it comes from some older versions of the linguistic theories of translation is to find um, to try to evoke the same response in a modern audience that was evoked in the original audience of that Greek text. Now, roughly, we would call this thought for thought. So instead of translating, uh, let's say, uh, in the old King James, gird up the loins of your mind, which most people don't know what that means, uh, the, the NIV or, or modern dynamic equivalent might say, get your minds ready for action or be prepared. Uh, that would be a dynamic equivalent. My translation is clunky and chunky. My editor at the university first called it chunky. I like that. And that is, I want to give people the opportunity to feel the Greek text behind the English text, not because I think the NIV or the NRSV or the CEB are wrong. I like them. That's the translations that I use. Um, but so that people can see in a sense look through the skin and the muscle to see the bones that are actually at work in the text so um i don't have the niv exactly in front of me here but i'm looking at matthew chapter 8 when jesus heals i translate jesus and i transliterate names entering petros's house saw petros's mother-in-law tossed down and fevering he touched her hand and the fever released her and she arose and was serving them. It was evening. And then there's a pause. They offered to him many demonized persons and he tossed out the spirits with a word and all those in a bad way were healed. Well, the NIV would probably say something like this. When Jesus was entering into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law uh, lying in a bed probably, and uh, she had a fever. Jesus touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and was, and, and they probably just say, and served him. 
So they make it sound like English. I'm trying to make it sound more like the original Greek text as much as is possible and still get an English sense across so that people would know what's being said. I, I imagine there will be people who think at times that I translate in such a way that it's difficult to know what the English means. And at that point, uh, I, would, I would say we probably disagree whether this makes sense, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> the, what you just shared feels uh, more disruptive. Like instead of, um, well, I noticed that you, were, you used the word uh, demonized instead of possessed. I noticed that you used the word toss out instead of um, cast, cast out. out. Uh, or she was thrown down. Uh, when in the or maybe not that's not the right word. To Toss used. down, tossed uh, down. The same word. Tossed down. Yeah. Instead yeah. of laid down on a bed. Uh, yeah. It seems like the verbs are more disruptive and demonstrative than what you're finding in the NIV. Would that be accurate? Uh, I like the word disruptive there. I think that's right. I'm trying to slow people down to use similar words. So when the balo, the Greek word is balo, to throw, and, to, and I use the word, I translate balo with toss every time in the New Testament. So when balo is used, I'm going to use that word toss. And, we're, and it's not a natural, normal, so let's say, English idiom. And that's okay for me. I'm trying to reproduce the Greek idiom as long as it can make sense in English. And demonized, um, is the word I translate for what we would call possessed, but the Greek word is, you know, I've virtually transliterated the word with the word demonized. Um, so that's that's what I'm doing. Uh, just to, I mean, I think I'm going to get people to slow down. I get I'm getting letters now every day, several, you know, ten of ten, twelve a day. I'm loving your translation. It's slowing me down. It's making me think about the text again. Just thank you. That sort of thing. So here we go. Praise God. So some of it is more word for word, and then some of it is is actually transliterated. Uh, I guess that would yeah, be more yeah. word for And some of it is actually like giving an idiom and trying to find an e English uh, way of conveying yeah. that idiom. Yeah. Um, so, you, know, you can't. Sometimes you can't use the, the Greek idiom. But... Um, um, I do transliterate names, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, and it started for me years ago when I realized that James is the name in Greek is Yakubos. And uh, James comes from a old French, old English, Yakimus, and it gets that M in there. And then it becomes James. But when we use the word Yakobos or Yaakov, all of a sudden we realize that we're talking about the patriarch of Israel. And that connection is completely lost. And that set me off over the years, often in my classes, not so much in sermons, but in my classes, I would transliterate names so that the students would hear what the Greek name is like. And I think that. Col I, I think it's dangerous to colonize people's names into an English equivalent. I think we should leave people's names alone so much as possible. Uh, so it's Ioannes, uh, is, you know, we would translate John. Um, you know, I, I think that's uh, Petros. Uh, Peter, that's that's not going to say much. Mariam or Maria for Mary, that's not going to do much. Uh, but Elisabeth uh, changes the name for Elizabeth. Uh, all of a sudden, we realize this is some Hebrew stuff that's going on here. So, um, yeah, that's uh, transliterating names was important to me. Well, you you, you mentioned transli tra when translating these names can be dangerous can you maybe drill down into exactly what you mean by dangerous like i would say that like you know J john one in the beginning was uh you know the word was with god and the word was god or the word was a god like that 
that is dangerous to me, right? Like when I think of changing yeah, yeah. something that like affects Christology, adding a preposition that's not there. Yeah, like like I'm right. We're probably using danger in a different way in that context. But when you say yeah. transliterating or colonizing those names can be dangerous, can you maybe just define that for like the average person out there? Because I actually have a lot of scholar friends that I respect a lot that they'll say James Jacob. You know, they'll they'll say the book and they'll say James, as you know of James, the book of Jacob. Like they'll correct you and they'll just they they won't even address it. They'll just move past it real quick because they they want you to know you're saying it wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah. I I agree that this is something that's becoming valuable to the Gentile church right now, which I think is interesting. Um, but could you maybe define why you think that could be dangerous? Well, here's the thing, is that it reflects um, the translator's willingness to colonize or to democratize or to swallow up one person's name and that reflects a culture for their own culture. So to make it English when it's Hebrew or to make it English when it's Greek is, is to, let's say, take the word and leave its country and its culture and put it into another culture. That's what dynamic equivalence does. And that's fine. I think that's the way we're going to do things like this all the time. My point is, there is a place for us to see that it's Jerusalem, um, not Jerusalem. Uh, that it, you know, that it's a, a yod or a, a y to begin with. It's Jesus. That it's not Jesus. Uh, that I think uh, respects the original Greek language, and it takes us back to the text. Now, I want to say again, I don't think these dynamic equivalent translations are wrong. And I don't think the translation theory is wrong. It's that John Golden Gate did this for the Old Testament, and I thought it was a worthwhile task for the New Testament. And I want to uh, try to help people get a feel for the text um, as it was, uh, get a uh, feel for what the text was more like in Greek than just in wonderful, dynamic, good speaking so, English. So it'd be fair to say that dangerous might be maybe even the wrong word, but that like that's part of the process. Um, Cause like, I mean, you, you're not saying that the NIV and the CSB, those are dangerous because they translate Jacob as James or Jacob as James any more than probably the Spanish translation of a Bible would say, you know, Yeshua or, you know, Hoshua for Joshua or whatever. Like it's, they're all translating to some capacity. So it's not like inherently dangerous to the message necessarily. Yeah, but you I feel mean, like you're, it, you're, it's you've really jumped on this word dangerous here. Well, uh, I, I just, I want to, I, mean, I want to be precise when people hear it because there are some people who t take it further and others who, and I don't think that you're taking it further than it needs to go. I just, I want to be, I want to be clear to our audience what exactly is being said. Well, you, well, you want I'm them saying. to know that their Bibles that they're reading now with those names are still safe, not dangerous. That's, right. That's exactly. Really what you're getting at. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I totally Let agree me... with that. I've already said that. But what I want to say is that there is something about swallowing up someone else's language in our language and thinking it's the same thing. I gotcha. don't I think I think we need to be respectful of how other people say things and pronounce things, and especially when it comes to names. Well, let me, let me see if by way of analogy this would help, and, and you tell me if this relates. You know, I remember, um, so I, I went to Lebanon, uh, first time I'd ever been to a Middle Eastern country. I had food poisoning on the plane, and so when I arrived, I literally just slept and then when I sort of came out of the sickness that I had, I suddenly find myself um, in a different country and smelling things that are so unfamiliar. And I look out the window or the the, the balcony, and it's like a, a world that is busy and polluted, some of it, where I was. And uh, there's all these noises and faces and words and languages that I don't understand. I, I feel like a fish out of water. And I, it's, it's like you just stepped into Narnia. 
right? And I imagine that what you're trying to do here with the names and with the uh, the more demonstrative verbs is in some way cause people to realize that they've stepped into a foreign territory, that they're in Narnia, and it causes them to to lose all sense of familiarity and be in that world. Is that is that kind of what you and Gold in, in the same tradition of Golden Gay have done in this? Exactly. Is that I'm trying to put these people, uh, the listeners and readers of the text, into a Greek world as much as I can. That's great. And when you uh, you, you mentioned in uh, your translation of Luke that they, and I don't want to misquote you here, but something to the effect of you know you wanted to give him educated doctor language right when he speaks. Um, I, I I had a a bit of a, a silly thought in my head like does that mean when you're translating Mark that, you know, he talks with a, a twang in his speech. Uh, does he talk with an accent when you translate Mark? Because uh, I've been told by a couple of scholars they dislike reading Mark in Greek. I, I wouldn't know I couldn't read Greek, but uh, that's that's what I hear. Well, you know, I here's my illustration. I tell my students that Mark is from Indiana, Matthew is from Illinois, and Luke is from the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and the Northeast, you know, the, the Ivy League. Um, Luke's, I mean, I, I taught Greek for many years, uh, and my students could translate Matthew and Mark, and I could give them the parallel passage in Luke, and they would struggle and sometimes not be able to pull it off because Luke's language is more sophisticated. So he starts out his his the book of Luke, the gospel, inasmuch as many have put their hand to order a narrative concerning the matters that are fully assured among us, just as the eyewitnesses from the beginning and those who became the word subordinates gave over to us, it seemed to me one who has carefully followed everything from above to write for you, exceptional God lover, a sequentially ordered narrative so that you may perceive with security the words into which you have been catechized. All right, that is <laughs> verses one through four. That is verses one through four in Luke, and it was one sentence in Greek. And he wanted you to feel like that's a lot to take in. That's what he did. And so that's the way I translate it. There's nothing like this in Matthew, Mark, or Paul uh, until you get to Hebrews chapter one, one through four, which has a very similar sophisticated beginning well acts has one too so yes i when uh here's here's a standard translation theory is that you translate according to your audience that's good and uh, the niv for instance has a policy of only using vocabulary that is a 12th grade and below they can't use a um of a word that is not found among let's say high school students and below all right that's fine and that's a perfectly uh that's an acceptable theory for translation but that doesn't mean that luke wrote at the level that only that 12th graders could understand the book of hebrews is not easy to understand for college students and even for seminarians who read the bible often so I wanted to, I really wanted, one of the reasons I wanted to translate this was to see if I could reflect in English the sophistication level of, let's say, each of the authors and reflect the style. Uh, because I was pressed by theory into more of a literal translation, it would have been difficult. But there were times when I thought I could jazz this sentence up a little bit and it would be... Um, much closer to how uh, Luke actually translated or, or Luke actually wrote it. So, yeah, there we go. Fantastic. Okay. So what does it mean uh, when you say that you're trying to prioritize conveying rather than explaining in your translation? Can you give us examples of passages where they convey the Greek meaning uh, that might leave lots of room for interpretation or, or might not quite explain it fully? Um, the word convey comes from Robert Alter, 
Um, the point the point is this. I think it's more of a theoretical statement. It has to just be done by examples over and over. And that is, there is a tendency to try to explain the text when the Greek is not quite clear. Here's a good example. Do you know what I mean by the Pistis Christu debate? I mean, do you know what this is about? This is... Uh, I can't see your faces. So no. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, right. No, no. Okay, I'm not familiar with it. Josh, are you? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. There is in Paul, uh, it's mostly Paul, there are this this expression, pistis Christu, that is oh, the faith, faith of Christ. Yeah, the faith of Christ. Is it faith in Christ or the faith of Christ? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I remember that. Okay. To, okay. Con- to convey it, I translated the Christ faith. The tendency to explain is found in the translations that determine that it is belief or faith in Christ or the faithfulness of Christ. Okay, so Tom Wright and Richard Hayes will translate the faithfulness of Christ. They see it as what's called a subjective genitive. Uh, The typical evangelical Protestant reform type are going to see it as an objective genitive. That's faith in Christ. The word in is not there, uh, but they clarify it. That's called. That's what I mean by interpreting, or um, you know, explaining the text. They're explaining it for us. Yeah, they're explaining it for us so that there's no ambiguity. Now, let me just put it this way: the Greek text is a good expression for it. Is underdetermined. That is, it's ambiguous. It's faith of Christ or just Christ's faith. How that is directed from faith to Christ or Christ to faith is an interpretive move that is worthy of translators and interpreters, but the text itself is underdetermined. And when we explain it, we overdetermine the original text. Mm. That's good. So that's, I mean, so, so that, you're, that clarify? I, I remember reading the book. You're of leaving Hebrews. the ambiguity in there. Yeah, you're yeah, letting the Bible ambiguity. reader interpret themselves. Correct. Yes. So exactly. I remember reading the Book of Hebrews, um, and I had I'd had an, an NIV, I think, until Bible school, and I picked up an NASB because my um, professor liked it, you know. So I, I picked up an NASB, and Hebrews one said something like, "He upholds all things by the word of his power," and I was like, "What?" Like it should read, yeah. "He upholds yeah, all things by the of power, power of his word." Like that's the way it should read. And it was actually the ambiguity and the the harshness of those words being translated that way that caused me to look up what does this mean and why is it written this way? And I feel like that's yeah. what your translation does over and over again. It 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 causes you to stop and go, wait, that's not how that should read. Like, um, that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. And it actually causes you to like look into commentaries. It causes you to study it. Like, well, why do they translate it this way? And why do they translate it that way? And it causes you to like drill into it a little bit deeper. And I feel like that's, um, (laughs) it's, it's the, it's the equivalent of a speed bump in a shopping mall, right? Like, okay, maybe I should slow down. Okay. You know, so you're reading a text and you hit a speed bump and you're like, okay, the bottom of my car just scratched the bottom of the pavement. I should probably slow down in my reading here. Um, and I find that your translation actually does a really (laughs) healthy job of causing the reader to slow down. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I can see that one moment in Bible school, like in the every page of your translation that I've read, I was like, that's helpful. And frankly, I read the books that I had studied. So I knew the Greek words that you were using for like in, in Galatians for revelation, you use the word apocalypse. And in and, and the word for hypocrite, you used, you know, masked, the, the double masked people. I was like, wow, that's really interesting uh, an average reader would dive into a commentary if they were reading this this text and i think that's that's wonderful well i like the idea of speed bumps i hope there's a speed bump in every verse to <laughs> slow people down to um i and you know another thing i did uh because of john golden gay's uh first testament was um to try to eliminate religious vocabulary that is customary to christians so i don't use the word holy I don't use the word justification. I use the word devoted because I think the word holy means something that is devoted to God. 
And justification is such a loaded theological term in Christian theology that there's no way that the translation justification doesn't carry a lot of that theological baggage with it. So I just use the word right or rightness or as in writing the ship. So that's uh, that's sort of some of the things that we were doing in the translation. Are well, there other other areas where you've left ambiguity that most of us just sort of take for granted, uh, either in the Reformed tradition, you know, your ESV guys, or on the other side of that? Well, uh, Michael, the uh, in Greek, the genitive case is inherently ambiguous. So uh, I leave some of those types, like faith, like the Christ faith, uh, that sort of thing. I try to avoid over-determining uh, an underdetermined expression. So if it's just a genitive is just a, a noun with another noun and the word of between them. So that's the way we translate it. So the house of God. Now I often use possessives. So I'll just say God's house um, because I think it's pretty clear in, in the Greek that's what's going on. But some of them are ambiguous. And I, and I think if it's ambiguous, I try to leave it ambiguous. So, yeah. I'm just I, wondering, are there I, other examples of that outside of uh, that, that one in Romans that we just sort of take well, for granted? Like, this is what this means, that the authors have done the work for us uh, when it's not so um, clear. You know, I don't, I can't come up with any in my head right now. Or translators. Uh, intentional intentional ambiguity. Okay. Well, I, I'm thinking of one in Galatians. Um, in, in Galatians, um, shoot. I've got, I've got a Bible on me. I have to go look at it in Galatians 3. Um, but, uh, I, I, I got it. So I had a question when I, I mentioned the NASB just a moment ago, uh, as a word for word or a new King James, I think new King James is a more of a word for word kind of thing as well. Um, would your translation compare to those kinds of word for word oh, yeah. translations more? I and how would you compare it to them. those? <laughs> yeah, do I outdo yeah. Them. yeah. Yeah. I just, Mine I perfected what you started. <laughs> mine is more more mine is more formal than theirs, and by the way, I have a, a copy of the NASB with Galatians at the top misspelled with a I O N S instead of I A N S. But yes, um, <laughs> nice. Mine is mine is um, far more word for word than theirs. Uh, it's a you have as many misspellings as the NASB does. The what's that? I was, do you have as many misspellings in your translation as the NASB does? Oh, I'm, I'm just sure joking. I do. I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm sure I do. I mean, they had a whole team. I just have one person, you know. Yeah. And plus my editor. So, but it, um, it is mine is is more is more like the NASB, <laughs> the old ASV. <laughs> I I frankly haven't looked at the New King James version, but uh, yes, it's uh, it's word for word, very much so. so I've got a question that might be. Uh, a little bit out of the box. Hopefully nobody's asked you this before and, and you feel free to answer it or not answer it or be political about it. But um, <laughs> have you found any uh, any criticisms that have come your way regarding uh, your translation that you go, you know, that's actually a very valid criticism and one worth mentioning? Uh, someone asked me why I translated the, uh, this is an interesting one. I can't, it, it's in the book of Acts where uh, the singular psuche, which means it's often translated soul, and I use the word self. I used a plural for a singular noun because the pronoun with it was plural. But when they brought that up, I thought, eh, I could have used the singular there. Uh, it's not, you know, these are the sorts of things. But I mean, we found a couple, we found a few mistakes in the, in the you know, that's, we're going to find them. And we're going to, by the end of April, yeah. I'm going to send in my list. I found a bunch of them in Golden Gay. Um, but um, over time, yes, I think there'll be people who, who want to take issue with me for using the word empire for kingdom. They'll take issue for me for using the word Covenant are the expression covenant code for the law. Well, um, now explain ex explain that. You why use the word empire instead of kingdom? 
Uh, that's an interesting one to me. I, you know, I kind of come out of a, I would say a semi vineyard tradition. Jack Deere was one of my mentors. Um, and so when we, that's one of the most, I'd say more impassioned things that we preach about uh, is the kingdom of God. And, you know, John Wimber's kind of message on that. Tell me, why did you use the word empire? Okay. The Greek word is basileia. Mm-hmm. The, the word is used at the time of the gospel writers for the people who were the Herodians, for instance. Um, and in the New Testament, we have God's kingdom. And that use of the word God with the word kingdom is transformative. It moves it from a human kingdom to a divine kingdom. And when you move to the divine kingdom, it's the whole world. And the only word in English that was available, or it wasn't in English at the time, that is like that in the first century would be imperium in Latin, and it would be empire. So I use the word empire to demonstrate the expansiveness of this kingdom that Jesus is talking about. It wasn't just Israel. It was the whole world. So empire in it has a more of a conquest no. aspect. Is that right? No, not conquest. No. That's that's military. More it encompassing. With the, it's all encompassing. Vast. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think of like when we talk about the the – the UK, the United Kingdom, we typically just think of the land mass that's in the northwest part of Europe. But when we think about the uh, British Empire, we're suddenly including all the colonies. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that makes sense that you would say that the empire is more encompassing than just <laughs> a kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what, with uh, with your, your, your translation, do you find that there was one uh, subject that I've seen on online that's uh, emerged a bit already. Um, not not a ton because it's a pretty new book. I mean, you had it published like June sixth, right? Yeah, June thirteenth, I think, is when it yeah. actually came um, out. Was was the subject of the egalitarianism, and and maybe it was because of podcasts you've done or not? Um, do you find that that your translation is um, biased to one or the other? Or you're like, well, no, it's just right, and therefore it is egalitarian, because uh, I know that that's the position that you hold. So, uh, yeah, how, how yeah you... I was I was curious for the same. Yeah, just just I know that that's something that's been brought up. I, I'm curious how that uh, how how you've taken response to any of that. Well, I, you know, every translator is going to leave their own impressions. Uh, the sure. committees will will neutralize everything, uh, but they like to think they're neutralizing, but they're. It's a it's a reflection of the group that's in the room making the decisions. Okay, uh, two examples. Number one, uh, I'll give three examples. I use the word siblings instead of the word brothers in the I think the ESV or brothers and sisters consistently in the NRSV and the NIV, etc. CEB. So I use siblings. It's one word. And it is broader than brothers, but it is not overtly, uh, it's, it's not too bad. It's not a harsh, egal. it's not a strong egalitarian claim. I like the word siblings. All right. There, there are times in the, in the book of Acts where speeches are given to, the word is used as men. And I I degenderize that and just use things like uh, the audience or the people or something like that. Uh, there's one where I really, I really wanted to do this. There's a Greek word Andrea, and it can it it means literally manly. It is normally translated courage, and for the longest time I had the word manly, and in the end I thought oh, I'm just gonna get people irritated by this. Um, but I could have gone in that direction. So those are the sorts of decisions I was making that I think would reflect a little bit of my egalitarian. What is going to really uh, draw attention is what I did to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 through 16. I have 
uh, it's not just Paul's talking, it's Paul quoting his opponents. And, and a lot of people have thought all the words from verses 2 through 16 are Paul's. I don't agree with that. And in 1 Corinthians 14, I do not think some of that text was original. Uh, that's not at all new to me. Uh, that neither one of those interpretations are new, but I reflected that. And for some people, that will show my egalitarian bias. Sure. Um, although I don't call myself an egalitarian, I call myself a mutualist. But there you go. Call it egalitarian, and I would say, yeah, I'm probably guilty of that. There. Well, let me let me ask you kind of a follow up question because you mentioned a lot of these guys have committees and teams, and you mentioned earlier. You know, maybe I have just as many spelling errors, maybe more, because I don't have a team to go through. Did, did you have, you know, theologian friends that you like sent this to and said, hey, you know, what do you think about this Was chapter? There any kind of what peer do you think review? About this? Or, yeah, like, did you were you bouncing ideas off of guys as you were putting this stuff together, or, or well, was this I really had quite a, alone? a few people. I had, let's say, between, I mean, I had like thirty people on my prayer team who to whom I sent stuff all the time. Uh, but I don't, some of them were pursuing it in Greek. I had, uh, people who read Greek, who read it, uh, while I was translating it. Uh, I had editors who read Greek and they were looking it over, but, um, it really is my translation and, uh, it was not done by a committee. Although in most, cha- most committees, an individual would have been assigned to the book the first time, and then the committee would have, let's say, edited into shape to reflect the whole committee. Would you encourage people to preach from something like this? Like, would because I remember, I remember, I could be crazy about this, but I, I want to say Eugene Peterson um, at some point in time was like, "Hey, you probably shouldn't preach from the message." Like, it's a paraphrase, and maybe I'm crazy in making that up, but I, I heard that somewhere, and 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 maybe I did. I listened to him. Uh, in an interview and maybe change his tune later. I don't know. Um, would you encourage people to preach from this uh, as a, a translation? Or do you think this is really better for reading the Bible slowly, maybe maybe referencing it uh, as you're preaching? I could see, again, that being very fruitful to say, the Greek literally renders here like this and, and, and quoting a second testament. How, how would you encourage pastors in the pulpit engaging with this? It's not a pulpit Bible. It's not meant to be read aloud. It would only be valuable if the people all have it in front of them. Let's say you print it in the bulletin and then they can read it along with you. But no, this is meant as a supplemental translation to help people uh, who are already familiar with the Bible. That's good. I I wouldn't preach from it. I'm going to preach Sunday. I'm not going to preach from it. What's your daily driver? What do you preach from? I preach from the text that the church I'm speaking at uses. uses. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to meet them where they're at. Um, your translation also tries to de- de-theologize the Bible. Isn't the West already de-theologized enough? <laughs> your average person doesn't well, know as much. I, I, sort of, uh, I sort of covered that with justification and... Uh, um yeah i mean i uh it's because those words didn't have those rich lengthy debated theological terms when they were written and here's here's what i i would say if you if you use the standard lexicon for the new testament power your stanker you will realize that they are they have christianized glosses or translations and if you pick up a classical Greek lexicon, those meanings don't show up. And that's part of, I think, good translation is to get into the skin of those original listeners and writers and use words the way they used them rather than the way the Christian tradition has interpreted them. That's great. Hey, Scott, I just want to, I want to thank you for coming on the program. We're at that point where yeah. we're going to wrap this one up. Um, guys, if you're watching, I would encourage you to check out Scott's book, the second Testament, got a link of it in the description. You can go check out that book. That'd be a great way to, uh, really, I think study 
uh, the New Testament, a way to kind of be reflective of the translations that you're using regularly. So I encourage you to go pick that up. Uh, also, if you're new to the channel, subscribe, like, share, all that good stuff. Uh, and Scott, if you wouldn't mind, I, I kind of want to toss it over uh, to you uh, as kind of a closing thought as, as people are walking away, thinking about how they read the Bible, what kind of encouragement would you place upon them when it comes to Bible translations? Um, and yeah, that'll kind of close us out on the program. Well, I would say what I've been saying for years, and that is all the translations, standard translations that people have access to are reliable and good. Uh, so I would say that. The second thing is read your Bible. A lot of people have a lot of Bibles. They have them on their phones. They have them in their computer, and they don't, they're not reading the Bible. So I would encourage people to read their Bible. Amen. You can't go wrong on a theology podcast by saying, read your Bible at the end of the program. If you didn't hear anything else, guys, I hope you heard that. Uh, go check it out, guys. Uh, links in the description for all the content. Scott, thank you so much for coming on and being with us once again. Uh, we really are thankful for you and your ministry. Uh, guys, thank you so much thank for tuning you. in. We'll see you next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time.